So let me start by thanking the organizers for this nice conference and allowing me to talk here. So let me start. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is a problem which I have been doing for past three years or something. It started while a visit to Nordica. Uh, and so let me go ahead and let me first tell you what is it about. So topological properties, by that I mean uh, flow properties of inertial particles. And in 2D turbulence, it could be in any chaotic flow. Okay, So we'll, let's go ahead and let's think about what are inertial particles. Uh, so inertial particles are all around us, aerosols, volcanic dust, pyroblasts, you know, just storms, um, chimney ash, you know, all those are examples of inertial particles. These particles could be either heavier or lighter than the ambient fluid. And for what concerns this talk, I'll be concentrating on particles whose mass or whose density is larger than the density of the surrounding fluid. Okay. So, how does one model these particles? Well, the modeling part was first done by Maxi and Riley in these celebrated equations in the uh, motion of a small rigid particle and so, uh, uh, in a non-uniform flow. However, when I say non-uniform flow, it's not a turbulent flow. It's still very simple non-chaotic flow so that the Reynolds number is much smaller than one is given by this equation and it's very complicated. I'm not going to go over all the terms, but it looks quite nasty. Uh, however, if you are, if you make an approximation that the density of the particle is much larger than the density of the fluid, then you can ignore most of the terms, okay? And what you're left with, all that mess becomes this, the dx by dt is v, so you just have the Stokes drag acting on the particle. And you know, the equation of motion of the particle is then the dx by dt is v, where v is the velocity of the particle, and dv by dt is minus one over tau, so tau is the Stokes drag. V, v is the velocity of the particle again, and u is the velocity of the fluid at the particle position, okay? So all that thing simplifies into this equation. And you know, if you are interested in non-dimensional number, the number that you look out for is the Stokes number, which is just the ratio of the uh, particle relaxation time to the flow relaxation time. And the kind of systems that we are thinking of are something like this cartoon, where you have some kind of a turbulent flow at large scale, and then there are these particles which are going through this flow. However, you are, we are going to assume that the size of the particle is small enough such that the, the flow that the particle sees is very regular. That means that the Reynolds number at the particle scale is going to be much less than one, whereas the Reynolds number of the fluid is going to be much larger than one so that it's turbulent. And why I want to do that is because I still want to use this equation. So I want to be in the regime where these equations are valid, which turns out to be variety of uh, atmospheric or um, other systems. And what we are, how do we do it? We do it with simulations. What we do is we take Navier-Stokes equations, couple it with the equation for inertial particles, and F is some external forcing, which just acts on large scales. Uh, and so here are the two snapshots. What first snapshot tells you is, so in the background, you have the pseudo-color plot of a stream function, and this is a typical particle trajectory, okay, which one sees. By the way, you will see this picture also on the conference webpage, so you can go again and you know, just look at it and enjoy the beauty of the picture. And then there is another picture which shows an instantaneous snapshot of large number of particles in a two-dimensional flow. And here the background is the vorticity. Okay? And once you look at these two pictures, you realize two things. One, the individual path of the, as the particle is going through, you see it makes these turns. Most probably it's getting trapped in some vertical region, right? And then the other thing that you see is that when you have large number of particles, they are sampling or they are being thrown out of the region of vortices, okay? Now, both these things are very well known and have been reported earlier, so I'm not the first one to show that. You can easily explain why the particles are not in region of vortex, and that's very easy. You just start by taking the inertial particle equations, take the divergence of V, divergence of U is zero, you're left with this term. If you assume velocity field to be that of a simple vortex, then it's trivial exercise to show that the divergence of V, the particle velocity is going to be the great, is going to be greater than zero. So the particles are going to be thrown out from the region of vortices, all right? Again, something which is very well known. So I won't go ahead too much into it. 
But what I want to now go into is something new, which is that, you know, when one is looking at this particle picture and coupling it to Navier Stokes, what one is doing is working in a Lagrangian frame, right? You are just tracking an individual particle in the fluid. On the other hand, you could have said, well, I don't want to do that. What I want to look at is, I want to think of this particle as a suspension, right? And if I think of it as a suspension, I should be able to write an equation for the density of the particle and velocity field of the particle, right? It's something similar to what you do for fluids. When you don't talk about individual water molecules going around, you say, well, look, I don't care about that. I want to think of it as a density field for the fluid and a momentum field for the fluid or velocity field for the fluid. The same thing I'm doing here. So the Lagrangian picture would be this and the Eulerian picture would be this. The rate of change of density is, so you have a continuity and then you have a, another term, the momentum equation, but with an additional Stokes track term plugged in. Okay, and this is the relation, this is how you would go from Lagrangian to an Eulerian frame. The first question is, why should I worry about it, right? I mean, okay, this is a formalism, you can always do it. The reason you can, should worry about it is, look, when I look at this picture, what I'm looking at is, the particles is going through different regions of the flow, right? So what I want to characterize is two things. One, what is the kind of flow field that the particle sees at, as, as it is going around? And number two, what is the particle, well, what is, if I was able to define flow gradients of the particle, right? So gradient of this V, what is the statistics of that? Okay, so these are the two questions that I want to understand. And if I'm interested in looking at the gradients of this velocity field, I better work in a continuum description. And that's why I'm interested in the, this Eulerian picture, all right? <coughs> I'll take the next step. The first thing whenever you would do such a thing is to first cross check what is the region of validity of this thing and that's what we did. So here is a concentration plot. So what I did is I took a two dimensional turbulent flow, put particles inside it and also evolved this equation inside it. And what you see is pictures which are like this and what you find is at small strokes number, you see the region where concentration is large, particles also accumulate. It is true even more when you increase the strokes track, the particles, you know, concentrate themselves in thin filamentary regions and that's where density peaks. Okay, regions outside this density is nearly zero. All right, so it shows that the particle description and the fluid description are actually, uh, or sorry, the particle and the continuum description both are consistent, right? They are working very well, so I could use either one of them. There is a catch though, all this is going to work for strokes number less than one. And the reason for that is in all these descriptions, you are not assuming any interaction between the particles. So particles can go through each other, whereas that can't happen in this kind of a continuum description. So in continuum, as you go on increasing strokes, you will find form more and more shocks, whereas in particles, the particles would just zoom through and the, this field would again become uniform. So however, just let's stick with the region where strokes is less than one, which is also what happens in most realistic cases, okay? And so the two descriptions work very well. So let's go ahead and if one was to think of what is the topological properties, well, you can just open any book on dynamical systems and thing would tell you that what you need to look at is the gradient of the velocity field, right? And if you then make a two-dimensional plot of determinant and trace, the topological properties could be, you know, differentiated into vertical regions, strain-dominated region, spiraling outward vortices, spiraling inward vortices, and so on. And you know, if you take a 2D turbulent flow, which is incompressible, here is a one such flow, then you can make a PDF of determinant, which is this axis here denoted by lambda, and you see a characteristic curve. Turns out that this is a universal curve. You take any two-dimensional turbulent fluid, you'll get a PDF of this form. The dots here are exper from experiments, okay? And so things work very well. Let's go ahead, let's ask ourselves, well, if I did this thing with Lagrangian's, uh, so if I redo the same thing first with Lagrangian picture, right? And then with the Eulerian framework, do the two things agree? And the answer is yes. So if I look at fluid velocity gradients along initial particle tracks and look at PDF of determinant of the velocity gradient, the fluid velocity gradient along the particle tracks, what I find is there is a very good agreement between Lagrangian as well as Eulerian picture. Now, what you can do much more is that you can ask yourself, what is the PDF 
of velocity gradients of the inertial particle itself. This quantity you can't get from Lagrangian picture, and you find something crazy. What you find is no matter what Stokes number you look at, the PDF rem remains more or less same. The PDF of the inertial particle velocity field gradients, right? The determinant of that is not changing with Stokes number, right? Why is that the case? Because I'm looking at the full field, whereas if I was looking at along a Lagrangian particle gradient, they would be sampling certain space, right? Whereas here, it's over the entire field, and you can prove that that should be the case because you can just take the Stokes drag equation, take, go to the limit where tau goes to zero, and you can do some simplifications and then show that the determinant of the fluid velocity gradient is same as the determinant of the particle velocity gradient, and it should be thus independence of the Stokes number, and that's what happens here. Uh, you can then ask what happens to the trace of the fluid velocity gradient. And what you find is that, well, the trace of the fluid velocity gradient systematically increases with Stokes number. And well, <coughs> and when you rescale it in some fashion, all the PDFs fall on top of each other. And again, you know, you can just do a perturbative analysis and show that the trace of the uh, particle velocity gradient is nothing but twice tau determinant of the fluid velocity gradient. And it works very well. However, so I have now 32 seconds. So I'll just wrap up. There is the thing which is very interesting is that if you look at the joint PDF of the trace of the fluid velocity gradient and the determinant of the fluid velocity gradient, then you see a curve which looks like this, okay? Now remember these were the different quadrants. And now what you find is, one, that most of the regions are regions where fluid is a spiraling outward vortex, okay? And then the second is you are particles because they are going to get concentration, concentrated in regions of strain, but still with trace of A less than zero. Uh, okay, let me skip this and skip this. Let me just end with convenience that, you know, density weighted Eulerian and Lagrangian pictures are very identical and inertial particles not only re sample regions of large strain, which is what is known, but also regions of negative divergences. Okay, so with that I'll stop. No, so I I'll tell you, no, no, I'll tell you what the problem is in the, <coughs> so what happens is, happens is very simple. It's that in the, thank you, in the, so let me see if I pick out the correct picture. Ah, come on, let me, so see this. What happens is that the particles are not interacting with each other, right? So as you are going on increasing the strokes number, the things are becoming more and more sharper. The concentration field is becoming narrow, right? Now, what does that mean? It means that you're forming shocks. Shocks are the regions of discontinuity in the system. So that's where the continuum theory fails, right? You can't go beyond shocks. Whereas in the particle picture, the particles would just zoom through each other. Now, how do we define the derivative at a shock? So you can approach it till the shock, but what would happen is once the shock is formed, the shock will get advected wherever you go, right? Whereas in the particle picture, the shock is not going to form. The particles will accumulate and then eventually zoom through each other. So that's where the things deviate. Uh, so what do you mean by exactly? Yes. Yes, You, if you do that, you get these equations. Yes. Yes, yes. It's, if it's an incompressible fluid, the trace of A is zero, right? It's the inertial particle case, the trace of A is non-zero, right? So it's also two by two, but then the point is that I don't know what is the correlation between, so look, it's a time series. But it, I should know, so this is a turbulent flow, right? So then I should know the statistics of the velocity gradient tensor first, and so whatever is gradient, which is non-trivial statistics, has fat tails, and then I should, in the random matrix thing, I should know what is the correct thing I should look at, right? Sure. Really no, but the, because the first thing was because to do these simulations itself is non-trivial because you have shocks, so you have to treat it uh, specially. Yes. There is no diffusivity. There is so only advection. So I mean, 
point was, what is the model which is used for experiments and which is very successful? It's just dx by dt is minus 1 over tau v minus. Okay. So thermal diffusivity is negligible. So you'll get this. So that, that so you know what you get is uh, that changing as a function of as a function of some power law. So there's some Richardson law, Bachelor regime. So there are different regimes in which you lie. I haven't checked that explicitly because here the emphasis was more on to characterize the flow property. But that's being done. I mean, people look at it. Uh, how does R square varies at time? That's just 